<clears throat> Good evening. My name is Paul, and I'm a full-blown alcoholic. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here. Al- <clears throat> Alcoholics always say that. They're glad to be anywhere. Uh, <laughs> and I uh, want to thank the committee and anybody and everybody who had anything to do with inviting Max and I here. And I have the impression they kind of went overboard in inviting. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea that there were this many drunks in Everett. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I love to see uh, alcoholics uh, crowded together. I, uh, I love it when there are too many uh, too many alcoholics for the room, whether it's a big room or a little room. If uh, you crowd alcoholics together like that, they generate a great deal of energy, a great deal of love, and uh, I love that feeling. And So I'm not only glad I'm here, I'm glad you're here. In fact, it'd be a rather dull meeting without you. Uh, <laughs> I do feel a little bad about the uh, people that have to stand. But then a little voice in my head says, what the hell? You've got to stand. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I thought Larry Bear and uh, Al did a wonderful job of reading. He read it perfectly without a single error. Which is nice, but it kind of disappoints me because I, I kind of like the errors. Uh, I liked it like, uh, for instance, I remember the time an older woman was reading a portion of chapter 5, and she read it as, what an odor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or the time the fellow was reading the traditions, and he says, the only requirement for membership is a desire to start drinking. (laughs) I thought that made more sense than the way we have it now. (laughs) Let's be realistic. I like the way Pete started the meeting with the serenity prayer. It reminded me of a time, short time back, I was invited to... uh, talk at a fun Saturday afternoon fundraiser in a little area in Colorado. It had the event the year before, and it had 150 people and went well, and they decided to do it again, see if they couldn't get a couple hundred people, and they got to working on it. They invited us to come over, and then something happened, and uh, the fellow that was doing most of the work uh, got what they referred to as a resentment. Uh, I don't know if you have them up here or not, uh, but he quit, by God. He wasn't going to do it. Well, that gave everybody else a resentment. And they decided, they, by God, we're going to have it. They'd do it themselves, and they'd have uh, 250 people. And uh, they got to working on it and invited a lot of people, and... and uh, did such a hard, hard that there were actually 300 people. And what that did was to put a uh, strain on the caterer. It was catered to noon meal, followed by a speaker in that. But it, uh, he said it was okay. He had plenty of food, but it would just take him a little time to get it, get it prepared. It would be a little delayed. And the other thing happened was that uh, they had invited the local... Uh, minister to come and give the invocation and he hadn't showed up and so they went to uh, one of the old timers and said if the minister doesn't show up will will you give the invocation and he said well uh, uh, yeah okay and uh, so he started thinking about what he would say at the invocation and the caterer is preparing the food and the alcoholics are getting more and more hungry and the old timers making notes of what he's going to say and uh, finally the caterer says well the food is ready and the alcoholics wanted to run up and eat and no no you can't eat yet you have to have the invocation and so they called the old timer up to come up and give the invocation and he got up to read his notes 
And the first word on his notes was the word God, and he said God, and they all recited the serenity prayer and ran for the food. <laughs> That's such a, a good story. Uh, there ought to be a moral there somewhere. Uh, I guess the moral would be if you ever, when you get to be an old timer, if you're asked to give an invocation, don't bring God into it too soon. <laughs> or you'll lose your audience. Uh, anyhow, um, it was, uh, uh, people ask how your flight was when you get here, and, and the flight was fine. And uh, people always ask how, how, how that went. And on the, this flight we were on, it was, uh, you know, how, once you get to 30,000 feet, they say, well, now we give you all a, a drink, whatever your drink is. And they'll start to cart down the main the aisle. On this flight, they had a girl attendant and a boy attendant. And they're coming down the aisle. And Max and I sit where she's on the aisle on one side and I'm on the aisle on the other side. And that way we avoid the middle seat. And the cart comes down and the gal hands me a little bag of peanuts and a little cocktail napkin. And she says, and what would you like to drink, sir? And I said, well, I would like club soda with a twist. And she says, fine, thank you. And she gave me my drink and served the other people around there, and she moved the cart a few inches to the guy behind me, and she gave him his little bag of peanuts and a little cocktail napkin. And she says, and what would you like to drink, sir? And he said, I would like white wine. And she went through her cart, didn't find any white wine, and she said to the male attendant, do we have any white wine? This is all taking place right here. And he, male attendant says, no, we don't have any white wine, but we've got plenty of red wine. And she turned to the man behind me and she says, sir, we don't have any white wine. Would you like red wine? He had to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought to think about it, it had never occurred to me what a serious social blunder it would be <laughs> to drink the wrong color wine with airline peanuts. Yeah. <laughs> Which actually brings me to a, a problem. I, I'm looking for somebody to help me with this. Uh, you know, on all these planes, uh, each airline has their own local magazine that they put out, and they have it on each plane, and they like to read it, read it and take it with you. In American Airlines, it's American Way, I believe. And in reading through it, it has different articles, different stories, and different uh, things are the same each month and one of the things it has in there is the best buys and this gal write about the best buys and she lists the best audio and the best video and the best book and the best movie and the best this and the best that and under the best drinks she, uh, she had the best wines and under the best wines this gal said that the 1992 Napa Valley Chardonnay have a crisp pear apple flavor <laughs> with a touch of clove at the end. <laughs> now, what, what I'm looking for, <laughs> what I'm hoping to find is somebody who is planning a slip. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to know, but it's not worth going out to find out. <laughs> if you're out there anyway, you might as well learn something useful. And now it's it's the 1992. <laughs> 
1992 Napa Valley Chardonnay. And I really don't care that much about the crisp pear apple flavor, but I really would like to know if it leaves you with a touch of clove at the end. <laughs> Thunderbird never left me with a touch of gold. <laughs> Thunderbird was my favorite white wine. Yeah. <laughs> and Ripple was my favorite red wine. <laughs> so anyhow... Uh, I guess I should talk about my drinking. Uh, <laughs> hadn't this been a great uh, convention or conference up to this point? Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Robbie and uh, tried to enjoy Max's talk this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> if he'd have been a little more honest, I could have enjoyed it more. Uh, <laughs> Really not at all funny. Uh, <laughs> she drove me to drink for 28 years. She did. She drove me to drink for 28 years, and uh, my last birthday, I had been sober 30 years. And so now we're even, by God. I've been sober 30 years, last July 31st. And you know... Oh, Oh, yeah. hell, you're nowhere near as impressed as I am. Uh, <laughs> 30 years is the longest I have ever gone without a drink. <laughs> 30 years is a long time between drinks for me. In fact, if this keeps up, I may just give up drinking. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, 30 years since uh, uh, without a drink. And, and then Max pointed out to me the, this evening, uh, next Tuesday, uh, Max and I will have been married 58 years. Uh, uh, you're... you're you're nowhere near as impressed as I am. You know. I'm not even as impressed as Max is. You know. That's a long time. And in fact, we've known each other for over 75 years, I guess. And, uh, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This. Anyhow, I uh, she was driving me to drink all these years, and uh, it ended up that she uh, drove me into the nut ward. Is what she did. I <laughs> ended up in the nut ward of the hospital I was on the staff of. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yourself. Uh, I didn't think it was very damn funny. Uh, <laughs> In fact, it was a, a, a bad place to be. It was the St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange. And they're fanatics there. They're fanatics on uh, making leather belts. It's really, you can't get out of there until you make a leather belt or ashtray or something useful. And I swear, if they had a Senate investigation or something, they'd probably find their people have been there for years and they won't let them out until they make something. And, they try to convince me that the quality of my life would improve if I learned how to make a leather belt. <laughs> I told them, I said, that's ridiculous. I, I said, I've got a whole wall. I've got a whole wall full of licenses and certificates and diplomas and papers to prove that I've been educated way beyond my level of intelligence. <laughs> And I don't see how making a leather belt would improve my life in any capacity. 
I didn't understand the philosophy. And besides, I didn't understand the instructions. And I, <laughs> that wasn't my fault. That was the fault of that dumb occupational therapist. Because I've always known if you don't understand a thing well enough so you, can, so you can explain it to me so that I understand it, then you don't understand it as well as you're supposed to. And she'd explain it to me three times. I wasn't going to embarrass her by asking her a fourth time. I remember sitting there in a nut, nut word commiserating with myself about the series of misdiagnoses and poor medical management and bad breaks that a nice guy like me ended up in a place like that. And I, as, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'm a, uh, my background is uh, people, doctors have a patient they have problems with, they send them to me and I do a history and a physical and tell them what's wrong with them and tell them how to treat them and I uh, was good at it. And uh, Max and I worked to build up a big practice. Uh, but what, what, how Max got into it was that she was the girl next door, and when I got through in pharmacy school, I wanted to go to medical school, but it was during the Depression. My family didn't have any money, and they didn't want me to be a doctor anyhow. They wanted me to stay home and run a family drugstore. And I wanted to go to medical school, and there was no money. So my uh, answer to that was that I <clears throat> married the girl next door and suggested she work my way through medical school. <laughs> and... and uh, I figured the least I could do is let her work in the office uh, for for 25 years. <laughs> at, no salary, of course, because she's a member of the family. And so that's how we worked together and built this thing up. And when I saw that I was losing weight, I had convulsions a couple of times, and I was uh, uh, had this uh, terrible headaches and this sense of impending insanity, and uh, all these things happening to me. And I thought, my God, I need a good medical workup. And uh, I agreed with me that I needed a good medical workup. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized that I was the best diagnostician I knew at the time. And so I sat down and had a consultation with me. And <laughs> did some lab work, did a bit of a physical examination, and I went over the weight loss and the convulsions and the headaches and the sense of impending insanity. And it was obvious. I had a brain tumor. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd die and you'd all be sorry by God. You know? <laughs> and here I was in the nut ward. They missed the diagnosis at the Mayo Clinic. And here I am in the nut ward of the, uh, this uh, hospital, local hospital. And while I'm commiserating with myself about all this stuff that's happened to me, this dumb psychiatrist who c couldn't see that the problems were marital uh, <laughs> walked up behind me and uh, wanted to know if I'd be willing to talk to a man from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought, God almighty, don't I have enough problems of my own <laughs> without trying to help some drunk from AA? <laughs> I didn't know anything about alcoholism. The only thing I knew about alcoholism was if you treat one alcoholic, <clears throat> they'll all start coming to you. you know? <laughs> They all start coming to you, then the good patients will stop coming to you. And then all you'll have is alcoholics. And that they never pay their bill or keep their appointments anyhow. <laughs> but I can tell by the look on the psychiatrist's face that he thought it was a good idea. I don't know if you know that or not, but happiness on a nut ward is having a happy psychiatrist. And I was willing to go to any lengths to make him happy. And I said yes. And in no time at all, this clown comes galloping into the room yelling, My name is Frank and I'm an alcoholic. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I was embarrassed for him. Uh, <laughs> there he is meeting a perfect stranger and the only thing he can think of to say about himself is that he's an alcoholic. And, and a loud voice. God, he had a loud voice. Didn't he? told this whole story in a, in a loud voice. And I don't remember a word of it. Uh, but it was, uh, I think, I'm thinking, my God, man, why don't you lower your voice? I mean, these people all think I'm a nut. Why don't we just leave it at that? You know? <laughs> the only thing I remember is how it ended. He finally said, well, that's my story. I'm going to a meeting tonight. Would you like to go along? And I said, but I'll go. And... Uh, we went, 
And uh, I don't know what meeting we went to. I don't know how many meetings we went to, how meetings we went to before I knew what meeting I was at. But and I, I don't know anything about that man who led or who read or who prayed or anything. But I know that that meeting had a profound effect on the psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> he was suspiciously very interested in my case. Uh, what's it? What's this about? Uh, what's this about uh, the steps? Uh, what, what's this about meetings? Uh, what other kind of meetings do they have? How often do they have meetings? When are you going to go again? And I, I thought, oh my God, I've got me an alcoholic psychiatrist. <laughs> He's ashamed to go, so he's sending me. You know? <laughs> and, um, so I went every day I could. I got Frank take me every day. I didn't know how many brownie points I was getting per meeting, but I wanted all I could get. And I finally got enough so I could get discharged from that dump. And uh, I finally got discharged. I had no intentions of coming back to AA. Why would I? I wasn't an alcoholic. But the problem with that was that Max liked the AA meetings. Yeah. I'd say, let's go to a show. He said, no, 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 let's go to an AA meeting. Yeah. And uh, once I found out she liked them, then, of course, if she didn't shape up, I decided I wasn't going to go to AA anymore. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the al said that. Uh, <laughs> That's what Max did. She she couldn't drive. She's not an alcoholic, but she liked AA me, and she couldn't drive the freeway. And the, meeting, and the meetings were 35, 45 minutes away, and she got in the car, and she'd drive off to the meeting. Went, I don't know how she got there, but she'd go to the meeting by herself. I don't know if you ever tried that or not. You ever try, you ever try sitting at home on a Saturday night, drinking all by yourself? while your non-alcoholic spouse is off laughing it up at an AA meeting? <laughs> I thought it was rude. Yeah. <laughs> I had to go back to the meetings to find out what the alcoholics were laughing about. I found out they laugh at anything. <laughs> they laugh just to be laughing. I went to meetings for seven months, and then I went to one meeting too many, and I found myself laughing, and I haven't had a drink since. Yeah. Yeah, the laughter has been very therapeutic for me, and very spiritual. In fact. I'm convinced that my higher power laughs every time he hears alcoholics and al laugh. Even if he doesn't understand a joke. <laughs> and, uh, the laughter is very spiritual for me. And uh, so when I first turned into an alcoholic after that one meeting too many, I was a very, a very mild alcoholic. Very, very mild. Uh, almost a non-alcoholic. Uh, I was more allergic to alcohol. But I had a list of things I wasn't. I wasn't a wino. I wasn't a lush. I wasn't a, certainly wasn't a skid row bum. I wasn't a chronic inebriate. I wasn't a chronic drunk. Uh, I was uh, peculiarly to the drug alcohol. <laughs> I do weird and peculiar things when I drink. I can't control how much I drink once I start drinking, which really isn't that much of a problem. If that was my only problem, I just wouldn't drink. My main problem is that I, of myself, can't keep from starting. Uh, I not only can't control how much I drink when I start, I can't keep from starting. And it uh, took me a long time to figure that out. And uh, once I uh, saw that I was a mild alcoholic, I... Uh, here I was in AA, at the bottom of the social barrel. <laughs> I was ashamed that anybody out there knew that I was here. And I was ashamed to have you know that I was here. I was ashamed of the whole business. And then I thought, you know, I have a strong sense of failure in my life. 
And then here I am now, as I say, in the bottom of the social barrel, and feeling like a failure, I thought, my God, I ought to at least succeed in this, for God's sake. If I can't even succeed here, there's, this, is the, this is the worst. I mean, I mean I've got n no chance at all. And uh, in fact, back in those days, they used to say a lot, uh, don't leave now. <laughs> I thought I was just building up to something, for God's sake. Yeah. Don't you? Don't it, that makes you afraid to get up and walk out, doesn't it? When you, <laughs> the rest of you, by God, won't leave. I'll say. <laughs> so anyhow, back in those days, they used to say a lot: "Stick with the winners. Stick with the winners." Oh, he did come right back. Thank you. Let's give him a hand for coming back. Yeah. Um. This is they stick with the winners. And I thought, well, if I'm going to stick with the winners, I better know what a winner is. So I talked to Chuck C., uh, who had been sober, oh, 100 years or so. And I, I said, what's a winner? And I was surprised that he had to think about it for a while. And then he said, well, I, I guess you have to die sober to be a winner. And I thought, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I'd always planned on being a saint, and I'd even gotten the book, Lives of the Saints, in the big, thick book, and I'd been reading through it to find out which saint was going to be my role model. And I was very serious about this uh, business of being a saint, till I found out that the final requirement to being declared a saint was you had to be dead 300 years. <laughs> and I thought, well, screw that. I, didn't, I, I gave up my sainthood right there. And, and now to be a winner, I gotta die. And I thought, I've never been very enthused about any accolades I could win by dying. And so I decided, well, I won't worry about being a winner. I'll be worried about being a successful member of AA. And over the years, I, I didn't say it to anybody else. I made a commitment to myself that this, by God, is one place I'm going to succeed. I'm going to be a successful member of AA. And um, over the years, I've varied my definition of successful member. Uh, to some extent, but actually I don't know any successful members who drink uh, or take drugs. And uh, so, in fact, I do that to this day when I have a decision to make as to what to do, whether to do this or to do that. Uh, if I get lost into, I do that, well, they do this, and then that becomes a manipulation for me more than a decision. And so now today, if I have to make a decision, I'll ask myself, what would a successful member of AA do? What would a winner do? What would God have me do? What's the loving thing to do? All of which I think are the same question, and then that helps me decide what to do. In fact, I, I'm convinced that if I do a thing for the right motive and leave the results up to God, it turns out the way it's supposed to. And the deal with that is that it makes life so simple. All I've got to figure out is what's my motive. I don't have to figure out what you're going to do or not do or whether you're going to like it or not. All I have to figure out, what's my motive? And if love is my motive, uh, and love's always the right motive. And that's all I have to figure out. What's my motive? Leave the results up to God. And a lot of times I'm surprised at how things turn out. Uh, and it, but it sure makes it a lot simpler than the way it used to be. Um, Somehow when I was talking about uh, love being the right motive, the idea of uh, carrying the message of AA came to mind. Uh, I had uh, come across a paper, I don't know, it was a box 459 or whatever it was, <clears throat> and it was, I, I laid it on my dresser, so I saw it every day for a few days until I was clear in my mind as to what it said. And it said that Bill W., one of the two co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous <clears throat> had said that carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous was our primary aim and the chief reason for our existence. And I thought, that is pretty strong language. Our primary aim and the chief reason for our existence. Referring to us 
as individuals or us as groups or both. And um, it, it, it's impressed me that the, the importance of carrying the message and how we're doing it here. And we do it just by walking sober out there in a drinking society. We carry the message by being here sober and filling a chair. We carry it in a thousand ways. And, uh, but uh, taking that uh, as a reason for doing things makes it much simpler for me. Uh, a little odd a sideline of that was I happened to be in New York and went to the, uh, on Friday, went to visit the general service office. Uh, they asked me to participate in the Friday noon meeting they have there at the office. And I was in this center of carrying the message, and I said what I just said about primary aim and chief reason of our existence, and talked about the carrying the message from the office there. I got home, uh, was home a week or two, and got a phone call from uh, Frank Mauser, the archivist in New York. He wanted to know where I had gotten that phrase that I used because they'd gotten all steamed up about it. Well, I had by that time thrown away the paper that it was on, and so we had to start looking for it. Well, uh, he said something about they wanted to use it for the international, and uh, so I was talking to a gal named uh, Annette. They call her Annette the Jet because she loves to work on problems like that, and within 20 minutes she found the phrase in the uh, uh, AA Comes of Age on page 129, fifth line from the bottom. And so I sent the thing by email to Frank on the stationery for the International Convention, and I don't know how I got into that long story. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish I'd never started that. Uh, <laughs> I think I've come to the end of it. That's, that's, anyhow, uh, the other, see the problem I have, I, I, I thought that was terrific, the way uh, Pete was able to say that if people are talking and you want to hear, you're authorized to tell them when they take it outside because you want to hear. We're here to listen. And I thought, God, how wonderful. Wouldn't that be great if I could do that with all the people in my head? <laughs> You guys sit here and you're quiet and, and, and very easy to talk to. I'm trying to talk in a bit of a straight line with what I'm doing and not be too disconnected in that. And, and, and it's, but the people in my head are, the, God, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you can't hear what I got to listen to. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the stuff is, is illegal. And, uh, And even more of it is lewd. Uh, <laughs> and and I'm, I'm trying to talk in a straight line, and one of them will suggest something I'll talk about, and, they'll say, and then one of them will say, no, no, don't let them talk about that, let them talk about this here. And the third one will say, no, no, you guys don't let them talk about that, let them talk about this. And they get to fighting among themselves about what I ought to be talking about. And it's really very distracting. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, oh, shut up up there. Yeah. And they all shut up. And I can't think of anything to say. You know? <laughs> it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's even like uh, here at the t table. I mean, they couldn't need drink. They had tea there. Well, the tea has uh, caffeine in it. And even, even if I drink decaffeinated coffee, caffeine really triggers them, really gets them going. <laughs> <laughs> And even if I drink decaf, I'll, I'll lie down at night and almost be asleep. And one of them will say, do you suppose that really was decaf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> when I lie down at night, my body will say, my body's tired. Once I lie down and go to sleep, my brain says, no, let's lie here and talk about it for a while. <laughs> Or even if I get to sleep, about 3 o'clock, 3.30, they'll say, hey, wake up. Uh, we've had an emergency meeting, and we need to talk to you. <laughs> you, 
you know that thing that you thought went so well today? That was, that's not, you wait till morning, you'll find out. <laughs> I think, boy, I don't want to listen to that crap. And I'll roll over and go back to sleep. But just as I'm about to lose consciousness, I'll think to myself, boy, I'm glad I'm not thinking about that anymore. <laughs> and one of them will hear me and say, oh, I'm glad you're still awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's not the only dumb thing you've done. You've done a lot of dumb things. Let's spend the rest of the night making lists of dumb things you have done. It's really an awful time to take a fifth step. That's one of the things about uh, working the program. It's gotten me uh, much more comfortable with all those people up there in my head. And uh, they now, I used to fight them. I used to fight them. Uh, like there's one, uh, or I was completely baffled by him. There's one guy, only one, only one. There's one person up there that no matter what the situation is, whether it's too many people and you're afraid, or nobody around and you're lonely, or it's too hot, or it's too cold, or it's a happy occasion, or a sad occasion, no matter what it is, his suggestion is always the same. Let's have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> almost... It's almost like a command from God, you know. And every time he took a drink, we all got drunk. You know? and, but today, I, I just realized who they are. That's they're just them. That's my disease talking and all these other goofy people up there. And uh, I don't fight them at all. I don't fight them at all. I mean, it's, a, it's like uh, defects of character. Might as well get friendly with them because... Uh, <laughs> They love the fight. They really energize us in the fight. Now when they make stupid uh, suggestions, I think we'll say, well, thank you for participating. Now if you'll sit down, we'll call on somebody else. You know? And uh, we just take turns. And when they really, a bunch of them get to acting real crazy, I say, you guys need a meeting. Let's go to the meeting. You know? <laughs> well, you know, another interesting thing I found about that, all that noise and all that confusion and all that pandemonium that goes on, in the very, very center of me, there's a center of absolute calm. And that's where my higher power is. And that's where he's always been. But I didn't know it. And to not know it is kind of like it not being true. But now I know it. And I know that I can't go anywhere without him being with me. And that's... Uh, that's a great um, counterbalance to the personality in my head that's always afraid. No matter what it is, no, don't, don't do that, don't do that. You'll screw it up and they'll all laugh at you. But now I know that my higher power is with me, just anywhere I go. And I, I like that. That's very comforting. In fact, somebody said to me, asked me the other day, they said, do you, do you still get nervous when you're going to talk? And I said, well, I don't call it nervousness. I call it anticipatory anxiety. <laughs> uh, but I said, besides, I, I alter the third step prayer. Uh, I love the third step prayer. In the morning, when I awaken, before I'm even really awake, I like to say the third step prayer, the, the serenity prayer, and the sub-step prayer. And... Uh, for those who are new, uh, the third step prayer, the third step is made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God. And the third step prayer says, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will, and so on. And then at breakfast, Max and I say the serenity prayer, third step prayer, seventh step prayer. And we read some stuff, uh, al Anon literature and other literature, and then we have a period of silence. And throughout the day, when I'm going to do something that I'm a little apprehensive about, or a little bored, or just whatever, I'll say those three prayers again. And, uh, but like I said, if I'm going to talk, the third step prayer, and I'll modify it. And I'll say, God, I offer myself 
and this situation to you to do with as you wish. Now, I would like it to turn out phenomenally successful. <laughs> but if you have it in your mind that this is the night for me to make a complete ass of myself, <laughs> well, at least one of us will have a good time. You know? <laughs> I, I, I've, done a, I've loved the third step. I that, uh, made a decision to turn their will and their lives over the care of God. I remember when I first did that, uh, I, I recited the third step and the third step prayer on my knees with my sponsor as my witness. And I thought, well, that's a contract. And it uh, would be easy to break uh, maybe it needs more witnesses. So I went before my then three home groups and I recited the third step, third step and the third step prayer in order to make it harder to, theoretically harder to cancel the contract. And I thought, well, that's, that's still just verbal. That's just a verbal contract. So I went down to the uh, business supply store and I bought a blank form for setting up a limited partnership. And I filled it out and I gave my higher power a 51% controlling interest in my life. <laughs> and I made him the uh, general partner and I became the limited partner. And I felt better to have it in writing <clears throat> and I knew that he knew that it was in writing. But then I realized that all that shows is that a partnership exists. It doesn't talk about the terms of the partnership. So I had to sit down and I decided to sit down and draw up the terms of the partnership. Who's responsible for what? <laughs> so that when a problem comes up, it's already written down as to how you solve it. Basically, it's who's responsible for what. And I got a piece of paper and turned a line down the middle. And on one side, I put what's his responsibility, what's mine. And what that narrowed down to essentially was that he's in charge of worry. And I'm in charge of work. And he doesn't even like for me to help him. <laughs> he, he doesn't like for me to help him with the worry. And he never does a damn bit of the work. <laughs> What's mine's mine and what's his is his, you know. And I tell him, uh, I'll pedal and you steer. And for God's sake, watch where you're going. Uh, I'm sick of some of the places we've been, you know. <laughs> and it's worked out pretty well for me. And I like that. Uh, I stayed around uh, the program uh, long enough to find out that I needed to go to meetings to... Uh, stay sober. Uh, and I watched people who stayed sober on just meetings and saw a beautiful sobriety. People going to meeting every day maybe. Had beautiful sobriety right up to the time where they got drunk. <laughs> and then I decided I needed to do the steps in order to stay sober. And I gotten involved in doing the steps. And, uh, then I watched people who had done that, who had Come to meetings long enough to find out they had to work steps, stay sober, work the steps, and once they worked the steps, they got so sober they didn't need the meetings anymore. And got drunk after 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And so I decided I need both the steps and the uh, uh, meetings. I need both. I need both. I can't do it alone. I can't do it. I can't, but we can, as they say. And, uh, you you keep me sober. My efforts to help, my efforts to keep me sober didn't work. But my efforts to help you stay sober keep me sober. In fact, I got involved with some uh, papers, the uh, mimeograph sheets that I got from down in Texas, where people were they got together and they would uh, form a uh, have a commitment to read their assignment before the meeting and at the meeting answer the questions on the sheets, 
on, was how to study the first 164 pages of the book. And when they came to a step, they would do the step. It wasn't a step study, it was a step do it. And uh, <laughs> the, the, there was parts, miss, steps missing, and typos and all that stuff. And so I sat down and I put it together and I made a pamphlet out of it and had, took the risk of having some printed. And then I thought, well, now what am I going to do with these? You can't sell them because it's really just the big book, how to study the big book. And there's nothing there except what's in the book. And uh, so I remembered uh, computer software where uh, they have shareware. Instead of selling the program, uh, people get it for free, and then if they like it, they decide to pay for it. So I'll put the pamphlet out, and the people who use it and want to make a donation to keep more printed and pay for the postage to mail them out, uh, they can do that. And uh, so I put them out, gave them out to anybody that wanted them, and enough money dribbled in, I had some more printed, and that's been picking up momentum. And uh, up to this day, I've printed 22,000 of those and distribute them uh, for free. And the point of how I got into that long story, <laughs> there had to be a punchline there someplace. Uh, I thought that the point that I'm interested in about that was that because of that involvement with that and people saying, when am I going to start a group to do it? And when am I going to be in another group and so on? I've been involved in it enough that it's turned out that not by plan, but it just worked out that about every five years, I've redone all the steps to the best of my ability. I haven't necessarily rewritten the whole fourth step and all that stuff, but I've done what I see necessary, and I've redone all the steps about every five years. And every time I've done that, I've moved to a new plateau in my sobriety. It's just, it's, can't, remember how it was the first time you did the steps? It's that, it moved on. And uh, how am I going to end that story? Uh, I, I have to get away from that. And I, but anyway, I'm glad I did it. And uh, then, uh, one of the things that uh, I was talking about, Max and I uh, being married since a long time, what I, we've made kind of a, a hobby out of uh, interpersonal communications. Because as she said earlier, our communications were zilch. Uh, we did, we we're better at fighting than any other kind of communication. And uh, as I said, she's been, she was very difficult to live with. Uh, <laughs> I, I've come up with some basic beliefs in that. In that I like to believe, I choose to believe, that people treat me the way I have taught them to treat me. That if I don't like the way people are treating me, there's something I need to do about me, not something I need to do about you. And I uh, have come to believe also that a measure of communication is the result it produces. That if I'm communicating with somebody else and I don't like the result, it's not their fault. It's my fault that I'm not communicating effectively. And um, it, it, that, I like that. That brings it back to me. There's something I can do about it. It's much easier. It's difficult, but it's much easier to change me than it is to get somebody else to change. We came into the program. Max wanted, was working on me, and I was working on her. <laughs> and the harder we worked, the worse it got. <laughs> And it, I understand that's the way it is that the, many couples going into marriage counseling and that. And so what we've learned in the program is I've got my program, she's got her program, we each work on ourselves. It's like uh, Elsa C. used to say, when two people each have their own program, it's like two railroad tracks separately but together going in the same direction with all those meetings hold, holding it together. And uh, it's a great way to go. It's a great way. I, I just love being, uh, I love this way of life. I love AA. Uh, I love the AA way of life. I, lo I love it enough that uh, I love being an alcoholic. I, uh, I had a hard time becoming an alcoholic and uh, <laughs> it was a, 
But now that I, I'm where I am, uh, I love being alcoholic. I love being alcoholic now that I'm sober. It was, it was kind of a drag there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I, let me say, say this and I'll sit down. Uh, speaking of, uh, of computer programs, somebody was showing me a computer uh, program where you put data in the computer and this program would make a chart out of it, make a pie chart or a bar graph and color it and fancify it, beautiful thing. And I thought, what would a chart, a graph of my life look like if I had a giant computer and all the facts of my life put in the computer, what would a graph of my life look like? And I become convinced it would be a giant V resemble like uh, the Jelinek chart, for instance, that my life started way, way over there, and it's going to end way, 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 way over there. <laughs> and from where it started until July 31st, 1967, it was on a downhill course. Now, it wasn't a straight line down. It was just enough ups to keep me confused. <laughs> And the downward trend was down until finally it ended up in the nut ward of the staff I, of the hospital I was on the staff of. And that wasn't bad enough. I had to go to AA. <laughs> I went to AA for seven months, one meeting too many. And I finally, on July 31st, 1967, I finally accepted the fact that I, of all people, <laughs> strange as it might seem, even though I had no choice in the matter whatsoever, I really was a mild alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs>
And once you accept the reality of the situation, then you have a choice. So acceptance is empowering because then we have a choice of what we're going to do about it. But until we accept, we can't do anything. It's not condoning that when you accept, it's just facing the reality, the fact of the thing. And I uh, as a, took a half, uh, most of my lifetime to figure that out. And, uh, you know, my time's up. And I don't want to sit down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're so much better than the people in my head. <laughs> But I don't know if that's much of a compliment or not either. But, but, uh, but uh, I, I'm just delighted to be here. It's been great to be here. I love being an alcoholic. And I, I, I want to say I love you all. When I was new and people said, I love you all, it really bugged me. <laughs> I said, oh, you big liar. You don't even know me. And if you did, you wouldn't like me. And I, but truth is, I, I love you all whether you like it or not. Thank you very much.